Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you're about to receive the world's first international medical podcast, hosted by three paramedics from different countries. Live from the UK, Finland and Australia, this is Group Call. Good morning, ladies and gents. Uh, today, we're going to discuss fitness tests and fitness assessments for ambulance clinicians. Uh, do uh, do we need them? Those tests, are they really necessary? Or maybe they are a form of uh, discrimination. Or maybe the tests should be there, but they are not really relevant. Maybe we should change them. Uh, please stay tuned for uh, Group Call Live. Uh, good morning, guys. How are you today? Yep. Very good. Uh, Very good, thank yeah. you. Good. I, I really like those shows. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's 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 all me, <laughs> ketamine and kebabs. Uh, guys, I knew that yeah. it's going to be a good episode, <laughs> and we chosen a good topic because the discussion started far before we started the episode. Uh, in a moment, I will jump in and um, read some comments. But let me remind you, ladies and gents, that you can not only comment uh, live on Facebook, on YouTube, but you can also call us live. It is 0790-8947. Uh, you can call us uh, on mobile, you can call us on WhatsApp. So uh, wake up your fingers uh, or put your drinks down if you're on the Southern Hemisphere uh, and comment um let us know what are the um, assessments uh, at your um, workplace and do you have them or maybe you don't really have them. If you have them, are they really relevant? Um, and also uh, how your employer looks at um, musculoskeletal injuries at workplace. Um, Harrison and uh, Timu are uh, with us today. Um, in a moment, we also will jump across the ocean to see what Gina uh, has to say. But let's start with um, Harrison and Timo. Uh, guys, do you have uh, tests, uh, the fitness assessments um, at your workplace or not really? Yeah, yeah. So in Australia, we do for most services um, and definitely in the service that I work in, we have a pre-employment um, mm. physical exam, uh, well, physical and medical. So they go through medical history and, and basic medical assessment and the like, but there's a, a test of your physical capacity. Um, and it covers off some pretty broad um, components, um, both involving um, aerobic capacity and, and ability for running so that you're running on a treadmill for a little while, uh, but also core strength. So you're doing like your plunking and your, and your leg holds and also lifting strength as well. Um, and grip strength is also assessed as well. So it's quite a broad um, and thorough assessment that we go through in, in my service. And um, the document I've got here is about six years old now. I've had a look at some of the other services in Australia and it's not quite as um, in depth. I don't quite, mm -hmm. not quite as stringent we'll say as well. Um, so our criteria for lifting is, um, is a bit stronger, but it could also be reflective of the fact that it, the document itself is a little bit older and maybe up for review, which is what we're going to Demo? discuss today. Yeah, um, my service has like a test that um, mm -hmm. you can take if you want to when you're starting your employment. Uh, you don't need to take it. It's more for yourself to like get a good assessment of like your um, fitness and capabilities. Uh, it mostly includes uh, things that you would do, uh, like during the like like mm -hmm. in the actual line of work. So like lifting the stretcher, putting it on the truck, um, lifting a patient, dragging a patient, um, going up some flights of stairs with your kids with you, and stuff like that. Um, that that's timed and then like compared to like this. Um, like a, a chart mm -hmm. to evaluate you, uh, but you, oh, you don't right. need to take it. It's not not a, requir a requirement. And also, um, if you do and you don't do that well on it, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't change anything, basically. Um, so yeah, it's it's mostly just for yourself to like um, find out where you are, get motivated, get working out, get exercising. So it's not really a pre-employment assessment. So it doesn't matter whether you pass it or not, you will still be given a job? Yeah, it's they 
they have been doing it like pre-employment or like during the interview process. Um, and then there's been like some situations where like, for example, because I, I was employed before mm-hmm. this came in, then I, I was able to take it later on um, during like a training day to find out where I was. Um, and it okay, was so, really, uh, pretty good. Again, you can pass it or not. Harrison, uh, what about Australia? Is it yeah. like a proper pre-employment assessment or like with Timo, you can just have it or not? Yeah, so the services that I know of that have them in place, they are a, a requirement of your employment to pass that test. And certainly the one in my service is that is the case. Um, they do allow you a couple of couple of shots at it from what I understand. But yeah, it is a it is a requirement of your role to to meet the physical standards set out in those particular documents. And look, they're fairly reasonable. They're not super difficult. You don't have to be He-Man. I mean, God knows I'm not the, the fittest person around and, and I pass them quite quite easily. Um, but there are many, um, many people, because we might even discuss later on um, the age, um, you know, requirements of the role as well and, and the age demographics of people in the job and how mm-hmm. that affects your physical capacity. Um, so there, there's certainly some aspects of, of the assessments that might be more difficult for, for certain people, um, certain people than others. But yeah, it is a requirement. If you don't pass, you um, don't get the job. Uh, Joseph from uh, British Columbia, Canada. Hi, guys. Um, said, uh, well, we have the tests and is a fairly minimal pickup of one hundred pounds from the ground to waist height i believe he said stair stepper until you hit a certain heart rate push-ups and some sit-ups uh, sled push pull uh it's not very intensive he said uh in the uk it's very trust specific some trusts will um offer you a pre-employment assessment some won't um most common is a lift you need to um, lift a 12 stone mannequin which is uh, around 75 76 kilos i think and then um together with the colleague of course and then uh, you walk up the staircase 10 steps and down the staircase both ends so effectively you need to perform this um lift four times up and down foot end and head end uh sometimes some t- sorry some trusts will give you a uh, grip test uh length strength test and so on so on so on but again uh, it's not really um, uh, really uh, common uh and 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 it's very very trust specific um guys do you think that those tests um are accurate do they really reflect what is required in our job or maybe it's a form of discrimination and i'm saying that on purpose because uh back in the days like 20 years ago in this country uh they had a test uh, a height test you could not get the job you wouldn't get a job if you were i think below 170 centimeters in height and the um official um uh, justification of this test was that you have to be uh, tall enough to reach the highest shelf from the ambulance. But apparently, what I found out really recently, yeah, <laughs> apparently it was a form of discrimination of certain uh, minorities. They didn't want short people from certain minorities in the in the service. How awful was that? Guys, what do you think? Well, I, I think tests that actually test like you on things like lifting the stretcher or pulling it out, putting it into the truck, um, lifting a patient, like manual handling procedures that we actually do, um, I think are more reflective of the work that we do, obviously, than just like doing like bench presses and uh, push-ups and stuff Mm -hmm. like that in a gym. Um, Because obviously those usually engage like a few muscle groups Whereas the, the work that we do usually involves the whole body, mm-hmm. especially the core, um, legs, hopefully, and maybe arms, hopefully a little less. Um, so, yeah, I, I think they are the best that we have right now and best that we will have for a long time if we want to test like physical fitness. Um, and I find it, well, it's it's funny 
and also it's not funny that they actually had like a height limit to to working on the ambulance service just based on like reaching shelves <laughs> um but yeah I'm, I'm i'm glad that that's not a thing anymore <laughs> As as someone who's about 185 centimeters in my service, we use the 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 van ambulance. You sometimes hear them called, um, not the big boxy types. And I'm often <laughs> standing up like that. So I think being yeah. under 170 would be a benefit. Um, yeah, look, I I agree with Timu in that I think these types of assessments are going to be less and less important as um, as things develop. So what I mean by that is technology. Like, do you guys in your services use um, power lift stretches, or are they so they manual? We, we do. We, we have the power lift, lift stretches uh, in in the UK. In Poland, I believe that guys are still using the manual strikers. Temo. Yeah, we have we have the manual ones as well. Um, yeah, and, and they, they are yeah. awful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of the criteria, I mean, it even says in um, in the assessment criteria that it's, you know, this is what it is designed to, um, you know, emulate is the lifting of the stretcher. But we've had these these power load stretchers in the service for quite a number of years now. And I think as um, technology gets better and, say, monitors get smaller, because that's probably the heaviest thing that we carry uh, on a regular basis is going to be the monitor, um, as as technology gets gets more compact and lighter, I think these physical requirements are going to be less and less important. And I think if you look at the service, I mean, I'm not like Alex and I haven't been in the industry for 40 <laughs> Watch years. Out, very uh, thin eyes. Very <laughs> thin eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if you if you look at if you look at um, pre hospital work over over many, many years, um, it's become more academic and less physical. It used to be scoop up take them off to hospital and there's less of that happening um both the scooping and also the, the taking to hospital and it's more about finding other pathways so yeah i think these physical requirement requirements although as i agree, agree with timu they're the best they have ro- right now um but i think as years go on and mental handling takes more of a focus it's certainly a big focus for us over here um, and i hope it is the same in other countries as well um that the these set criteria of being able to lift 42 kilos from 245 millimeters off the ground and that kind of is very sterile testing environments um i think they'll they'll decrease a bit paul uh, from australia uh just joined us hi paul uh good to have you on show um paul said uh, that um they all in australia they also have uh a colorblind test you couldn't uh oh sorry we also had a test meaning if you were colorblind you couldn't get into the service uh but there are some changes now some out some of our staff weight just over 50 kilos mm, yeah um speaking of um what are the policies uh with uh, at your workplace guys uh, what your employees uh, are saying about fitness and how we should maintain the fitness uh, in the trust I work for. The policy states that uh, it is um, up to the employee. It is the employee uh, duty to maintain the level of fitness that is uh, accurate for the job we do. Uh, Is it the same thing in Finland? Sorry, in Australia? Yeah, yeah, there's no yearly testing um with the exception of some of the aeromedical services so that the hems flight paramedics and the like um do have to go through res- um, regular physical assessments um but that's because of you know winching and and lo- the like that their, their jobs are a little bit more physical demanding than on road but no we don't have any specific physical requirements mm-hmm. um as a yearly basis it is on the paramedic to maintain um a level of capacity that allows them to do their job properly there are a lot of um pathways and assistances and programs that they've put in place to help people uh with that so uh organizing discount gym memberships and the like through through the employer and um just regularly doing um you know every couple of months a, a focus on something um but yeah it is very much you know, 
autonomous. Mm-hmm. You you decide if you want to do that or not. Temu? Yeah, we have. Um, th- there's no like clear cut clear cut protocols on like maintaining your level of fitness or anything like that. But it is on the paramedic to do it. Um, we do get like um, benefits to like get cheaper gym memberships, stuff like that. And we also get to work out on the job if we have the time. And there's facilities on the stations to do that. Um, in, in terms of like the, the protocols surrounding like the whole manual handling and everything, we don't have stuff like the like South Central had when I, when I was working in the UK. So basically the employer recommends like mm-hmm. minimizing um, lifting and minimizing like Mm-hmm. dangerous lifts and there, there's like training that's being provided on like how to do it properly just like in the UK on, on in terms of manual handling um, so that that's that's quite good but we we do use like pieces of equipment that require quite a lot of like physical like actual lifting and stuff like that so okay, we do end up l- having l- to do me, quite a bit. Let me clarify that because I don't know if I heard correctly. You have facilities at on, on stations like gyms, like firefighters. There. Yeah. So so basically, um, most ambulance services in Finland either operate mm-hmm. out of a fire station um, or out of uh, like out of the hospital, like go out from the hospital itself. Um, I think almost all oh, hospitals wow. have a gym there. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure all of fire stations have a gym. Um, and as we are not as busy as you guys are, um, I think approximately like 50 to 60 percent of the time we are on the on the jobs and on the road. Um, we do get time off between the jobs to actually go and work out, uh, especially if you are not working like in a city center. If you're working mm-hmm. in a more rural area, then you can actually easily do like a one hour workout, uh, take a shower, <laughs> go to a sauna, relax. Let me just buy my tickets to Finland. Uh, so... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm coming over there too, but save me a spot. <laughs> yeah, so I, I have I have like co-workers that work out like on every shift that they're on and they that's that's all they do and that's more than enough for them. I'm speechless. Uh, I, uh... Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. At the most, we, you know, the odd branch has an exercise bike that someone's brought in, but there's no um, no supplied equipment. Um, I saw um, Alex's eyes roll when you mentioned the firefighters as well. You know, they've got to do something with their time, don't they? So, yeah. You, can't, you know what? You can't just be on just, the couch just all ask day. my Polish colleagues true, who true. are based at the hospital. So, uh, if they are not on actual job, what they do, they are helping out. Uh, the emergency room staff, the A and E staff. That's what they do at the time. Hello. Yeah. No. Not um, much downtime is there. Facebook, guys. Uh, on uh, on the Facebook, we we really started a quite fire discussion. Uh, Matty said um, on the question. The question was: uh, Are the tests or fitness assessments really necessary for ambulance clinicians? He said no. Fitness has uh, no uh, bearing on clinical ap- uh, aptitude, uh, he said. Uh, there is merit in fitness testing for specific physically demanding role like mountain rescue. But if, like me, you just drive a flashy delivery van from chest pain to sore anus, <clears throat> yep, uh, you're probably okay to be fat, broken, and no legless. Uh, I feel that's a bit sarcastic. Uh, clinician, he said, should not be the indicator for fitness testing. The role you perform as a clinician should be. Uh, Karen replied to Marty. She said, mm, physical fitness plays a huge role in your ability to function during rotationing, uh, uh, rotating, sorry, rotating shifts, recovery, resilience, and mental health. That's important. We, we, we need to speak about that in a second. Mm. Uh, she also said all mm. factors that are important for clinicians working shift work and responding to emergency situations. As for uh, what level of fitness and how to uh, best measure is very debatable. That's very true. That's why we have this debate here. Um, Emilia uh, from Australia, she mm. said, uh, disagree. Even non-specialized uh, paramedics are more than <clears throat> clinical decision makers. That's very true. She said part of this job is physical. 
would say that even more than not just a part. Um, what about the need to perform manual tasks uh, such as CPR, lifting, critically unwell patients, carrying equipment, etc., etc., et in the pre-hospital setting, ac uh, accessing and treating patients also take place in challenging settings. Uh, cannot agree more. Um, mental health. Mm. Huh? Some interesting points. Yeah. Yeah. In really interesting point from Karen there that um, I think we've been looking at this very much as, you know, the lifting and, and the manual handling of the job. But yeah, physical health is so much more than that. Um, and it's 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 strongly linked to your to your mental health. But also, as Karen said, the ability to bounce back after um, rotating shifts. I think that's actually a really, really excellent point. You don't have to be a bodybuilder to do a night shift. Um, you don't have to bench 200 kilos to be able to work overnight. But I think, yeah, physical fitness and well-being definitely does play a part in that as well. So really, really good and point there. As an uh, eldest member of the team, <laughs> I can say that it is actually, um, it, it, it plays a role here, the, the physical um, fitness uh, and absolutely affects mental um condition of the of the of the paramedic or clinician if you like um come johnson uh, said yeah i have to agree uh, that a minimum level is required bending lifting C lifting cpr shift work resilience uh, but again uh, look at, at, at the arguments our uh, our viewers just uh, put here uh, there's nothing about cpr in pre-employment checks uh, is it Mm. No, and no. I, I think like there, there, there were really good points there, and I, I also posted like some comments there. Um, basically, what I think it boils down to is that yes, I do agree that it's it takes more than just muscles to do this job. So it is clinical decision making, and it's really academic, like Harrison said before, um, and it's becoming more and more academic. Then again. One might argue that if you are physically fit, then mm. your head will work better. Um, you're like in a better space and with your th thoughts and everything. So th there has been like clear link that, 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 like proven between mm. physical health and then like um, mental health, but also like cognition uh -huh. and stuff like that. And, and also like. It's, I think it's a discussion between like, is it, is it beneficial? Yes. Is it absolutely necessary to be like a human? No. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a fine balance and it's, in my opinion, it's more up to the employer and to the employee uh, to maintain a good level of fitness than for the employer to actually provide the opportunities to do that um, in, in a safe and um, quite cost-effective way as well, just like provide gym membership or provide time to do it on the job. Um, and then it's also much easier to do it because then you don't mm. need to work a 12 or shift and then go to the gym on your own time, pay mm. out of your own pocket and stuff like that. It's it's like... Yeah, the, the, it's the question is, if the employer wants us to maintain the level of fitness, uh, should they support us in some way like you mentioned Tim, like like facilities on stations or and time and time to use them because you you may have a great gym um on the station and you mm. never get there because you're so busy and then when you finish your shift you just want to go home because you're hour or two hours late um speaking of uh aaron um who uh, participated in the previous episode um on EIO versus um, IV, yeah, uh, he's on shift today. IV. Uh, uh, IV. So um, say have a good shift, mate. Uh, he started six o'clock, so he promised to catch up later um, with the recording. Um, so the question is: uh, Should employers support ambulance clinicians in maintaining the level of fitness, Mr. Silva? Yeah, uh, definitely yes. Um, I, I think it depends on the service, on like how they do it. My service can actually basically just provide the the gym on the station, and then say, well, if if you have free time between jobs, go there, work out. Um, that's incentivized. If if you if you get hurt there, it's covered on your insurance, so there's no worry about that. 
Um, then again, like in busier services, like in the UK, in Australia, um, I think it would be much more beneficial to actually provide like cheaper gym membership. Um, maybe some like if, if you go to the gym for an hour, that might be like paid time to do it, but it, it won't be during your shift because that's going to be really hard to actually provide. Um, and to take a crew off the road. Yeah, but that's actually for an them interesting point. Because, uh, in the UK, ah, then, if you uh, do your e-learning, uh, some certain time of the e-learning is uh, this time is is paid by the uh, employer. So maybe we should have something like this, like a day, a month, mm -hmm. or maybe one day per two, three months to maintain the level of fitness. And this day should be paid. Is that a good idea? Yeah. Yeah. And also, like, the other option is mm. to, like, provide the incentives. So, like, obviously, I I'm not advocating for, like, difference in pay or anything like that based on, like, your physical fitness. <laughs> but Or, like, or like you don't need to meet any goals. But I think, like, if, if you work out, let's say, once a week, um, and, and that's, like, How can you prove it that like, you've done it. Show your muscles um, or what? <laughs> no, I, I, just like if, if if you go to a gym that's like listed on like a, like let's say your service provides okay you can mm -hmm. go to these five gyms and work out you sign in you sign out they get the list or you've been Alex has been there every week five times a week <laughs> or he's been working, working out with those kebabs yeah <laughs> or listening just to sitting the, in the shower Spotify, yeah <laughs> or so now. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, but so, I don't know, like so, something like that. So some some incentives or just like support, and and I think like one important bit is like maybe like provide like a not a full time personal trainer, but maybe like a session with a personal trainer to like figure mm -hmm. out where you're at, uh, dietitian um, stuff like that as well, because we do get like mental health benefits, like we like. My service, like if, if I want to go and talk to a therapist or something, I can do that at least three times a year. So why not a dietitian or yeah. a personal trainer? Mm -hmm. And it's all, I think it's all about investing in the personnel because um, like any investment, hopefully, uh, you're going to get a positive return from it. So like Timu mentioned, and my, my service is very similar. We, we are able to get um, mental health um uh leave to to be able to see um particular physicians um but also yeah we get i think eight sessions every every 12 months or something that are, that are covered by work so i think being able to invest money or time or both in the physical fitness of paramedics is going to help services in the long run with decreased injuries and therefore decreased costs involved with that as well um, Alex and Tao, you know, we already do online continuing education and have to do your e-learning and that sort of stuff. Um, we actually did in my service uh, about six months or so ago now. Um, we had three days face-to-face um, -face learning um, in regard to manual handling. So we all, we all do manual handling mm -hmm. um, during our induction, uh, but we've got quite a lot of equipment available to us. Um, in my service, both equipment that we carry on the truck and also specific resources as well that carry um, extra equipment. And we had three days um, training around that as well. Now, yeah, those three days, we're not lifting weights, we're not building our physical fitness, but we're, we're protecting ourselves, we're learning techniques and learning how to use the equipment properly to maintain our own well-being. And that sort of goes back to what we said earlier as well, how I think these um these physical requirements are getting less and less important as we get more and more equipment to be able to to perform the role more safely now it's never going to go away there's always even despite all the you can have all the equipment in the world and occasionally it's just not going to work and you're going to have to lift this patient you and your partner yeah. and there's no one around to help you there's there's all you, you can't fully eliminate that um but i'd actually really we spoke a little bit about the the power stretches um, before, but what sort of equipment do you guys carry either on your trucks or on specific resources, or or do you have any for for lifting? So and manual on um, our on British trucks, you will have a set of manual handling aids, and again, it can vary from a uh, trust to trust, but. Basically, you should have a banana board, which is a plastic board for lateral transfers. 
You should have a set of uh, sliding sheets. Uh, you should have a manga elk, so an uh, inflatable cushion to lift the patient or push mm. them away from yeah. from a wall. Uh, okay. You should have a um, set of uh, extension handles for sliding sheets. You should have something which is called mega mover, but I don't like to, to, to call it like that. Because can you imagine the patient, like the patient is there on the floor and you you, you look at the patient and you said, oi mate, bring the mega mover. It's just not right. Mm, <laughs> the, 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 the carry canvas. Uh, uh, thingy um and that's basically mm. it. of course we also have um uh, the, those the, those electric or, or pneumatic stretchers if you like um to help in in, mm. in lifting um also the sliding board to slide them from the bed to to bed at a hospital from the stretcher to bed and so mm. on so on temo um we have the um like the manual type of striker stretcher and um, we have a carry chair and we have the the green well, sort of the green sheets that you put on the bed that you that they have like loopy handle holes on them mm. and mm. that's all we have we that's don't all. have a banana board no but, sliding sheets but you have um, no but you have belts, facilities no on stations else. okay and you spend 50 percent of your shift on the stations so you know what <laughs> yeah so we just, are, we're basically so ripped just, that we don't need uh, them yeah no we don't need it <laughs> no but yeah. Like, obviously okay fine I, I i think it's good that we don't have the manga else <sighs> come on we have new work. ones now okay <laughs> yeah we do speaking of oh wow okay speak, that's good uh-huh. No, I, no. In, in all honesty, I think the manga elk is a really is, nice, nice piece of equipment. Fantastic, awesome. Um, but yeah, we we have really, really poor manual handling equipment. Um, mm-hmm. When we go to the hospital or like our like area hospital, they have a sliding board wh- where we transfer mm-hmm. the patient from the um, stretcher to the bed. So we we get that for one transfer. But when we are lifting them up from the floor, it's all muscles lifting them from like between the wall and the toilet seat mm. all muscles lifting a like a <laughs> there's a na- nan down and we have to lift her up all manual handling and like from the um like from her elbow like um, armpits good. which is really not good and uh, guys so can, can, you, ways, can you hear that and, um, I'm, and now i'm talking to yeah. my british colleagues who are on the facebook so uh, i'm saying hello to claire I'm saying hello to Gareth. Uh, I'm saying saying hello to Lindsay. Hello, uh, Pavel uh, Rudzinski is with us as well. Uh, he also mentioned that uh, it, it needs to be a government requirement to issue a day uh, of uh, like uh, for uh, e-learning. We mentioned so why not? Hello, government. We here. Uh, you need to give us a day. You should. Uh, but yeah, getting back to uh, what um, Temu said no manual handling equipment or, or be, n- almost nothing that's that's really bad yeah yeah it is yeah it's really yeah. really bad and that's our, our service is very similar to, to yours alex in terms of the equipment that we carry the, the one piece that i heard timu mention a carry chair and yep. i heard you mention yep. earlier you get to carry a 12 stone yep. mannequin down on the down. chair mm-hmm. this is amazing and and ho- hopefully this this gets rolled out to more services. But we we have a little little wheelchair, little tiny fold up wheelchair, and I believe our service actually got this design from Ferno. But it's actually a trap that goes onto the back of the wheelchair that allows you to go down the stairs, and it is amazing. It's fantastic. It doesn't go up, but we do have another wheelchair, no. an electric one that does go up. But this one is in. Oh, it's it's so good, and even like sloped gravel driveways, you can lie it down. It's basically got like ten no tracks way. and just goes up. Yeah. Um, but the, these these tracks are on all the ambulances. Every, every ambulance is fitted with them. Every paramedic is trained on how to use it, and they work so so well. Um, but on on what Timu said, even with that small bit of equipment, um, with the right training and knowing how to use it effectively, um, there are ways that you can help prevent. Um, injuries to yourself and then you don't need this physical strength as an example on on one of these training days um, i'm about you know 120 kilos at the moment and uh one of the girls there she would have been all about 45 kilos i think it's all about how you lay out your slide sheets and the like she was able to drag me across a whole room just herself with just how um, sheets were positioned and the like no other help i was sitting up slumped against the wall she pushed me over she pulled the sheet, 
and drag me 10 meters and I weigh almost three times as much as her. So, mm -hmm. and she's, you know, not injured. She wasn't, you know, like using her arms, using her back. So it all comes down to yeah. knowledge, I think. And, and that's me, where the training is really, uh, really Jump in here. Uh, we also have the um, carriage chair with the additional uh, connectable truck system which goes up uh, sorry mm. which goes down but definitely doesn't go up and the thing you mentioned with the gravel oh god i That's hate god. gravel yeah. you know what before i joined ambulance service i thought that i will have a really nice big house with the gravel outside <laughs> now i know <laughs> that my house will have only one level <laughs> yep Sing exactly and the bedroom will story. be next yep. to the door yeah. and the door will be really wide and there will be no gravel outside but <laughs> Uh, but what is important, uh, you, you, you really said a very, very important thing, because uh, I'm a manual handling instructor. I assess um, uh, candidates for my ambulance service. And what I need to say, um, technique is the most important thing. You don't have to have a big muscles. You just need to have the technique. You need to get it right. So again, this is a very, very... Um, important message to all the candidates, all the students who are really nervous about um, assessments, really nervous about physical assessments. Am I strong enough? Or oh, maybe I should go to the gym and so on. Gym definitely is all right, but don't be scared because if you will get the technique, first time get the technique right, and it works. Look at me. Uh, I'm not a muscular person. I'm old. <laughs> I, I'm basically, well, nearly by the end of my career and I still can lift, I'm still capable of doing CPR and then lift and so on, so on, so on. It's predominantly technique. Um, guys, do you think it's, I'm right or no, no not really? Yeah, um, I, I was about to say that like about the, um, the, the track for the chair, um, because I, I know that the, the chairs that um, South Central had when I was working there in the UK, they were atrociously bad for lifting because the the, mm -hmm. the person at the bottom had to grab the um, yeah. like the curved part of like a metal bar, like mm -hmm. in this orientation, and then you had to have your like um, arm at a ninety degree angle, basically going mm -hmm. down some stairs. But then again, the, the track also didn't work always in the UK because like if you had like a carpeted yes. or spiral staircase, stair, you cannot use then, it on the spiral staircase. Yeah, yeah. then it wouldn't yeah. work. But the funny thing is we have those tracks here on some of our ambulances, <laughs> but not all of them. And mostly people don't even <laughs> don't use them. <laughs> so, yeah, o o OK, I'm also guilty of not using them when I should. Um, but at, at least our carry chairs are better for actual carrying. But still, it, it should not be that we have to carry with the chair going downstairs if the track works. Uh very interesting point uh, made by Neil. Uh, he said, uh, I think you should be assessed on how many hours of bullshit you can listen to without rolling your eyes or getting punched. 15 hours test. <laughs> Is that a reference to our podcast? Or? <laughs> oh, it's only an hour, right? Well, we, we, we hope, we, 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 I hope that we will finish before an hour, not 15 hours. But yeah. Um, <laughs> Musculoskeletal injuries at uh, workplace, guys. Uh, how does it look like um, in 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 beautiful Finland when you uh, spend the fifty percent of time in a sauna, not on the jobs? Um, they, they, from from my understanding, um, they are relatively common. Um, back problems are a huge thing for paramedics here. Um, like like I said, are pieces of manual handling equipment are basically non-existent. Um, the patients th here um, are on the larger side. Um, and then like there's loads and loads of like um, apartment buildings with lots and lots of stairs, not always elevators or the elevators might be sm too small to fit the chair and a paramedic inside uh, to go down. Um, and I think myself, I have had back pain from poor lifts almost like once a month or at least once every two months when I've been working. Um, obviously, working out does protect you slightly, but uh, 
like probably you're hurting yourself even before you get the back pain and then when you get the back pain then you know you've actually really hurt yourself and there's only so much yeah. that your spine can take and then it's game over so yeah uh, it's 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 way too common um it's a huge problem and it's going to be a huge problem in the future if nothing's Four in done five about it adults uh, in the uk will get a back pain in some stage um, of the work for ambulance service. Uh, is that the same in Australia? Yeah, I'm not sure of the exact statistic, but in terms of back pain, yeah, certainly. I, I'm so sort of surprised it's not 100%. Um, in terms of how many people end up off work, I, I won't say it's an unavoidable thing because it, it should be avoidable, um, but it's it's still quite prevalent despite everything despite our best efforts at the moment people are still getting hurt at work it's a real shame um and it's not even just the obvious stuff it's it's not the lifting the you know 180 kilo patient from behind the toilet it's even the opening and closing mm. of the side door of the ambulance um either either acutely either one one wrong movement or just over time that that you know that simple repetitive movement can cause issues as i said our ambulances are quite short so for people you know my height or, or even taller of which <laughs> there are a couple um it's really not the mm -hmm. best workplace to be able to you know be bending over like that i've had plenty of um jobs where i've for whatever reason had to stand up in the back of the ambulance um for a period of time and you know i get to get to the hospital i'm sort of walking in like this and you know <laughs> trying to find a bed for myself as and well and you're calling so, me old yeah hello <laughs> The the injuries, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm aging before my time. Um, yeah, yeah, look, the it is getting better. Um, from my knowledge, I don't have the exact numbers on how many people end up off work, but it is too many. We, now, interesting thing because you, you guys mentioned big patients or, or um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Bariatric patients. Thank you. Uh, demo, uh, which what is quite interesting because from uh, British statistics we know that majority of musculoskeletal injuries doesn't happen when you um, are actually lifting bariatric patients. Uh, musculoskeletal injuries occurs when you lift non-bariatric patients, and why so? Because when you approach um, the bariatric patients, a patient, your 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 mind getting into this, I need to be careful mode mm. because this is a huge patient so i need to employ technique i may use some manual handling aids if i'm not too lazy but with non-bariatric patients and you you you, you temu said uh none down so so uh, elderly lady on the floor that's where majority of musculoskeletal injuries occurs because your brain is not set for lift it's just yeah it's fine she's or he's not really heavy so i don't need to actually apply those principles of effective movement and just for my amazing students principles of effective movement remember it is your knees um, and hips relaxed your elbows close to the body short levers head up chin in and a good communication because we didn't touch the communication yet um so quickly remember that when you perform a manual handling task the communication needs to be clear and concise you can the, the, your team cannot uh, have any doubts what and how you want to do it they need to know so please remember the communication is the key and also forget this one two three because it's is it one two three and or are we mm. doing it on three or after three so it is ready yeah. steady lift push pull whatever and ready is a question how many times you've seen ready steady go no make sure that the, no not, 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 <laughs> no not ready, not ready. Uh, that's very important. So communication is the key. And also, we tend to moan about patients that, oh, they are grabbing stuff. So they are grabbing banisters, they are grabbing um, a furniture, and so on, so on, so on. Maybe they do it because they're not aware what's going to happen. So make them aware. We're going to leave you, leave you this way or that way. This is going to happen. And reduce the patient's fear and anxiety, which is A, a part of our role, TLC, tenderness, loving care, and two, we'll make our uh manual handling tasks um a bit easier and harrison you mentioned this cumulative stress because we need to remember that manual uh, musculoskeletal injuries uh occurs not only from this explosive lifts we perform this 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 stress uh, um, events sometimes they occur because of uh, cumulative stress 
repetitiveness of the of the um, manual handling task. So there are m- plenty of reasons for musculoskeletal injuries. So think before you do, think how you want to do it, and maybe you can avoid it. And last thing for me, I'm so, I know, I know, when I start talking about manual handling, it's like, yeah, okay, last thing. Remember, <laughs> guys, that manual handling, and again, I'm, I'm talking to, to, to my amazing students um, out there, it's not only lifting, it's pulling, pushing, um, basically any any physical activities you do, activity you perform on on your shift, an average 12 hour shift is nearly 12,000 manual handling tasks. It's it's it starts with when you open the door to the truck to to check if you have everything on the ambulance. Um, so it's not only lifting of your patients; it's also lifting of the equipment, opening, sliding the door, and so on, so on, so on. And now I will shut up and I will uh, uh, give the if you guys opportunity to say something in proper English. Yeah, I, I was I was just about like jump in with like one thing that came to mind really is that like you mm-hmm. you said about like manual handling tasks and it, it's it's not only lifting mm-hmm. or like the heavy things and like for example for myself I know the the thing I always fuck up the most is like I reach for things because I'm I'm tall I have like long hands I'm sitting in like the uh, the airway seats or like the the um uh, the 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 seat next to the stretcher in the ambulance and then i'm just reaching for everything uh, i'm gonna reach for a cannula I'm gonna reach for like mm-hmm. o2 mm-hmm. Uh, black nasal o2 cannula um or i might reach like to to grab the uh, the monitor even like from outside the truck i don't go next to it to lift it and it, it weighs quite a bit um so, so i reach and lift and i'm <laughs> always hurting myself doing that and I should just stop it. Guys, now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play uh, Gina's video, but give me two seconds because it will be uh, quite challenging now. Bear with. Uh, <laughs> it's just because she just actually s- sent it to us. So it is basically uh, hot, like like hot buns from, from bakery, hot of the press. Um, so give me two seconds. And I will play the hey, video. Hey, uh, this is Gina from the United States of America in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, today's topic is this isn't the job for the week. Yeah. Um, so with this uh, said, uh, we're talking about like the physical aspects of being a paramedic. Here in the United States of America, people's bodies weights fluctuate so much. Um, on the national average, I think they took a poll like a couple of years ago, and the national weight is around 190, 180 to 190, and then it can go up to 220 to 230 is the national average weight of an American. Well, that means that we need some safe patient handling equipment because we some people can't lift like 220 pounds on a good day so with the ambulance what we used to do when i first started there was a manual stretcher you had to physically put the stretcher the patient on the stretcher and then lift the stretcher into the ambulance with somebody lifting the legs and then securing it into that securing device called the antlers and then that was roughly about 110 pounds on that manual lifting stretcher well then they're just like well we need to have an auto like you know lift that with hydraulics so that might help with the retracting of the legs well that's awesome so then we put the patient on we push a button and then that helps raise the legs and the stretchers to meet that loading height then we still lift up on that stretcher and then retract it so with that battery holder system even though it it helps us with the hydraulics of actually lifting the patient it adds about 20 to 30 pounds so our stretcher roughly can weigh 150 160 when you got your monitor on the back and all the other crap so sometimes our stretcher weighs 160 pounds plus the patient's weight and then you lift the the whole person into the truck while retracting the legs and then putting them into the ambulance 
Well, then let's talk about, like, stay patient handling at the house. So they've fallen and they can't get up. True story. So they're sitting on the edge of the bed. The patient roughly weighs 330 pounds. What are you going to do? Well, there's different safety patient handling techniques. There's different items that one company and can purchase to help get this patient up. There's many, many different things. Again, based off of whatever agency you work for as to what type of safe patient handling equipment you have on your capabilities within your reach on your truck. So private ambulance agencies, they have like a loophole. So within the states that some people work for, there's different um, safe patient handling laws. So saying that you can only lift for so much for so long at a certain amount of weight so that you don't injure yourself or the patient makes complete sense, right? Well, if I don't purchase that ambulance in that state, I don't have to have that equipment. So with that being said, some private agencies don't actually have hardly any safety patient handling equipment. They get away with the lateral transfer device, which means like an anti-slip device or something that has ergonomic handles, like a soft stretcher or an LTS, which is something that is slip on the bottom that you can use for anti-friction. But as far as anything else goes, they get uh, like a loophole. Well, if you purchased your ambulance here in the state of Missouri, you have to have safe patient handling equipment as well as an auto load. So therefore, a lot of private agencies are like, hmm, well, I'm going to purchase it from somewhere else, which makes sense. Um, with the state of Missouri, they're trying very, very hard to actually help the patients and the EMS providers help us help them. So, we require that if you purchase an ambulance, you have to have the auto load, you have to have some safe patient handling equipment. If you work for a company that does do that, then you might have something called an abdominal binder lift. So something that kind of looks like a Kendrick extrication device or an AE or KED from back in the day that has 40 something handles on it. It's amazing. So you put this around the patient that's sitting on the floor that's fallen and can't get up in their bed that weighs roughly about 330 pounds. And you have that lifting handles because we don't want to yank on their arms to actually physically injure the patient. So we put that on there, we put it on just like a KD, but it has those handles, brilliant. So you lift them up, put them into the bed, and you're not hurting your back. This can be used at multiple different things. And then we have something called a hover mat. A hover mat and a hover jack. So it blows up like an air hockey table, and you can like literally push the patient by yourself with 30 pounds per square inch. So it takes that literally half that almost half that patient's weight off of that floor, which is where you're pushing against that gradient. And that's why that a lot of people have shoulder injuries, back injuries, arm injuries. It's because we're lifting and pushing all of that weight. So there's many different safety patient handling um, items and equipment. Please check your agencies to if they have that available and to learn your education about it. Um, but yes, this job is physically demanding. You probably need to at least get some type of daily exercise routine. Um, my monitor weighs probably 25 to 30 pounds. So when you're carrying all your gear into a house, especially a cardiac arrest, you can be roughly pulling and pushing about maybe 150, 160 pounds. So physically, this job, I don't think, is for the week. But if you have multiple different help and you have everybody you need, then you can have other people and delegate your responsibilities and then you'll be good to go. So um, please, with that being said, um, think about ergonomics and patient safety and I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you, Gina. Uh, as as uh, I said, hot of the press, uh, Gina Lurie Wendy from the United States. Uh, I think that she said a very important thing, guys. We uh, basically didn't stress enough or didn't underline enough. Uh, if you cannot lift, if you think that your individual um, capabilities are not enough, just ask for the team lift. Uh, just ask your colleagues. Um, ask for backup. Uh, get the firefighters from uh, fire stations. Let them earn their money. 
Don't live with your back, live with your firefighters. That's the golden yeah. um, Also, exactly. uh, I just uh, did a quick calculation. Two ta- 200 uh, pounds, um, she mentioned, is approximately 100 kilos. Uh, if someone uh, wants to uh, count in their heads uh, the, the weights uh, Gina mentioned. Uh, Lindsay said, uh, I think generally being encouraged to be more active would help with mental health with, within the ambulance service too, which uh, accounts for a lot of sickness, etc. That's 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 very fair point. But we already mentioned that physical fitness goes with the mental fitness. If, if your body is... Um, strong and healthy most likely your mind uh, also will be uh, with that being said i think that's now is time to say goodbye guys thank you so much for watching uh, if you have any further comments or questions please do not hesitate and pop them um, under this video in the comment section it's been a pleasure and privilege to be with you today uh harrison seed timu silver alex hepner this was group call live and see you guys in two weeks.